Welcome to the Libertarian Counterpoint. I'm Richard Fields. On the program today, we have Casey Ashford, a law clerk at uh, Pacific Legal Foundation, John Cameron, a development officer at Pacific Legal. Uh, in a private letter, uh, Attorney General Jeff Sessions has asked Congress for permission to go after medical marijuana. What in the world is he thinking about, John? Well, I don't, I don't think he is thinking. Uh, it's a massive misallocation of resources. The, um, the mood in the country is toward legalization. Um, the, the problem with having all the cops and all the courts and everything else is if you, if you um, take a big chunk of their income, which is busting people for pot, then prison guard jobs go away, DA jobs go away, assistant DA jobs go away. There's really no justification for the police state that we have if you, if you um, treat marijuana as you would treat anything else um, that has as few ill effects. And according to massive studies done throughout the world, uh, major uh, benefits of all kinds um, you know, for example, there's a lot of people uh, who have massive nausea uh, from various Western medicine, chemotherapy, treatment for HIV, uh, who find that uh, that goes away when they take a little cannabis. Uh, there, there are no valid peer-reviewed studies that indicate that it's a, any more of a gateway drug than a beer is, probably less so. Very few people uh, smoke a joint, rob a liquor store, and beat their wife, unlike you know a six pack of uh, Bud. So, the the this is old school regressive Republican politics at its worst, and I think it does appeal to um, you know the idea that that drugs of any kind are bad appeals to um, you know a hardcore segment of of the Republican uh, support. But I think it's a, a horrible misallocation of resources. And you're going to end up with a fight between the feds and the state. And in this case, since um, you know our new president is a big supporter of states' rights, it's going to be a tough fight. Well, he, uh, I mean, Trump made noises in the campaign that he was not particularly concerned about medical marijuana or any other use mm -hmm. of marijuana mm -hmm. during the campaign. Uh, is he going to, is, is Trump going to let him get let Jeff Sessions uh, follow through with his uh, his uh, uh, depression-era uh, uh, going after marijuana users? Well, I, I don't know, because Trump made noise during the campaign about not having a problem with it, but since then he's done a little flip-flop. And, and um, everybody in the Trump administration is being you know pursued uh, as if they were lepers by by the uh, swamp they're trying to drain and you know Sessions is having problems they're all under the gun and what happens when you're under the gun you you try to throw somebody under the bus and and with Jeff it might be marijuana users you know take the take the uh, take the target away it so take the spotlight off of Russia and put it on uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, law and order well it, yeah cuz you know, the, the Russia thing, there's no there there, but since the uh, mainstream media keeps going after them and, and the Democrats keep going after them and all the rest of that, uh, they're going to keep putting it up there and occupying, uh, you know, I guess uh, Pence uh, just hired a private attorney to, you know, f try to fend off all the Russian craziness. And, and so it's really, on the part of the, the, the people in the swamp, it's been in a a very very effective thing. They're they're tying them in knots that can't get anything done because they're having to put out these invisible Russian fires. So I th I th I'm hoping that Trump, uh, who um, if I don't know if he was going to do some of the things he's going to do, like you know get rid of a lot of regulation and hire the magnificent judges that he's hiring, I might have gone knocking on doors. But some of his other stuff makes me a little bit crazy. I'm hoping that he that he does what he talked about in the beginning of the campaign and tell Sessions, you know, you go after some serious stuff. Let, let's let's you let know, this I, work I, its Unfortunately, course. I don't see that happening. And okay. I think that uh, Jeff Sessions is enough of an old school uh, uh, prosecutor and mm -hmm. uh, drug warrior uh, straight out of the Nixon era that mm -hmm. would probably uh, not be comfortable with doing anything other than being a uh, ancillary drug uh, 
you know, lock them all up kind of a guy. What? Well, well as, as John um, alluded to earlier, this just isn't the right red herring if the Trump administration is looking to kind of take some of that attention away from other issues. Um, and President Trump does seem to care a lot about populist opinion. And as John mentioned, uh, that's just not resonating uh, with individuals these days. And that's what you really see reflected in the disparity in the law between uh, what the federal law says and the individual state movements to legalize or decriminalize. So if they're looking to kind of draw attention away, this isn't the right issue. And it's only going to be to the detriment of the Trump presidency. So I think it would be in President Trump's interest at least to listen to the people and stay away from uh, pursuing um, medical marijuana at a time when criminal justice reform is just so popular. Unfortunately, I don't trust Sessions. I don't trust his motives. I don't trust his uh, belief system. Uh, well, if you would trust President Trump's self-interest, hopefully. Maybe. Uh, <laughs> but it seems to vary. It get. seems to change from day to day. Yeah. Uh, J.P. Krauss was a high school student uh, who uh, made a, a speech. Tell us about the case that involved uh, in, in, that, that ensued from making a speech running for class office. Sure thing, Richard. So this is one of those situations that is just starkly unfair in that I'm glad the Pacific Legal Foundation is here to take action. So we have J.P. Krauss, a young high school student who made a fun, satirical speech in his AP history class as he was blazing the campaign trail throughout his high school. And so his speech included things like uh, saying that his opponent was going to raise taxes or build a wall between neighboring high schools, clearly not intending any actual um, actions that his opponent may have been taking since high schoolers cannot, in fact, raise taxes or build a wall. So he was parodying the Trump campaign? Yes, that's right. Okay. So he made a fun, lighthearted speech. And nonetheless, his high school administration decided that this uh, light humor was actually uh, somehow harassment. And so they decided to uh, decline his presidency and uh, did not allow him to become president of his high school despite the election results. And so the Pacific Legal Foundation uh, wrote a letter to the high school administration asking them if they would reinstate JP because this issue violated his First Amendment rights. No, students and, have First Amendment rights? I didn't know that. <laughs> you know, sometimes it may not feel like it, Richard, but actually the Supreme Court has agreed with the Pacific Legal Foundation in, in but actually the Pacific, but actually the Supreme Court has previously agreed uh, with this uh, idea that the First Amendment does not end at the steps uh, to the school door. And so, Luckily, actually just yesterday, in fact, the high school administration was able to reinstate JP successfully. So the letter did it? It did, it did. So that's another win for a Pacific Legal. A strongly worded and letter and the <laughs> school administration uh, knuckled under. I, th I think the strongly worded letter uh, and the fact that uh, um, this, this uh, what do they call it? Uh, had traction, had wheels, there's a new popular Optics, the optics of this case were, were wonderful. You have a very photogenic, likable, overachieving young man who actually represented his high school in an, kind of an intellectual Olympics and his high school came in fifth, uh, who was really kind of almost forced to make this little speech. His teacher said, go for it in class. He had nothing prepared and off the cuff, he did something funny. And so, uh, it really did so make. So the speech was ad lib. And the speech was pretty much ad lib, <laughs> and the the uh, the the school district. Was there a transcript or a recording? Well, there was Actually, a recording. Yeah, a student was uh, able to record it on his camera phone, and that's how how the school was able to well, see and, it. Well, and and that would have in some high schools, uh, the people aren't allowed to use their little camera phones, so they might they might I don't know if his high school was the one, but this uh, on the View, which is a very popular morning talk show. Um, Whoopi Goldberg actually talked about it and <laughs> talked about the fact that if we can't make jokes, you know, and can't be, there's too much rancor, there's too much bitterness, there's too much venom, humor has to, to, to be, and a high school student, come on. Well, it seems you know? to me that this is kind of counterintuitive anyway. If he was making fun of his opponent for 
uh, supposedly going to be building a wall, it would seem like he's making fun of Trump as opposed to the other way around. And I would have thought that the, uh, the education establishment would have been fine with that. I don't know what their thinking was. Do you know, Casey? You know, it's really unclear to me, too. I'm just glad that this issue did gain a lot of media traction because we don't want to suppress um, humor, especially uh, political, satirical humor, as students are engaging with the issues of the day. So the last thing we want to do is to dampen that and have a chilling effect on future free speech in schools. Benjamin Powell of the Independent Institute has been writing about immigration for years, and he is uh, saying that Immigration is positively correlated with uh, economic freedom. Now, of course, immigration, uh, or the fact that it exists, has been a better nor of the uh, Trump administration saying that we got to stop those immigrants from you know, coming in. Mm -hmm. But this would tend to indicate that uh, economics help with economic freedom, uh, John. Well, I think <clears throat> every good study, you know, peer-reviewed study, shows that even in this country where we have what was originally a safety net and is now a, a massive welfare system for for folks who um, apply for it. That even in this country, uh, the the benefit of immigration is a is a net plus to the tax base. You know, less usage of goods and services that are paid for by taxpayers. So um, I think people forget that we're a nation of immigrants. That um, even counting Native Americans, they're just a little bit older immigrants than the rest. And I think um, uh, I have a little bit of Irish in me, not as much as most people think. It's mostly scotch and a little water, some ice <laughs> on occasion. And um, I was looking up the, the Irish immigration uh, during the potato famine. Um, One-tenth of the population died from starvation as, as a result of bad policy and bad population, bad policy and a blight on potatoes, and it uh, especially affected the, the poor, uh, as most struggles do, and uh, another 10% immigrated. Many of them immigrated to the United States, and when they came here, even without, and this was in the 1840s, even without any formal immigration policy, they faced um, signs that said, uh, Irish need not apply. And they, they need not apply because they were willing to work at much lower wages than anyone else. And consistently what has happened is first generation immigrants come in and do jobs that people are unwilling to do that are native. Uh, we have a drastic example of that. Um, here in Sacramento a few years ago, INS raided uh, a local nursery. Um, and I can't remember the name of it since changed hands. And they had people working there 30 years that they thought had good papers. They didn't. They lost uh, some of their senior managers and much of their uh, experienced labor force. And they tried to go out and hire high school students and all the rest instead of um, Hispanics to fill those jobs. Um, and their own studies, five people applied, three showed up, one lasted a week. So, you know, there is, there is a place for the immigrant population. They go in and do those things that we are unwilling or unable to do and work very hard, save the next generation, does different type of work. And this has happened throughout history, throughout the world, and it is a positive good because they go from an environment where their, their life um, is, is much worse than nearly the worst person here so that anything they can and will do is a step up. And that raises all of us. And so, go ahead, Casey. I think that's actually uh, just part of, part of the bigger picture. I mean, immigration is just basic economics. The pie is not finite. The pie mm. is continuously growing. So it's not only low-skilled labor displacing over time, but it's also high-skilled labor. And this benefits everyone. Uh, for example, there weren't a finite number of jobs once uh, women joined the workforce, for example. There are additional jobs created as additional labor enters the market mm -hmm. and creates more prosperity overall, and the pie gets bigger. Um, in fact, I think something like 44% of companies worth over a billion dollars have a recent immigrant as part of their uh, founding partners. So immigration on net increases prosperity for everyone. And I think one of the key problems is that you can really see 
uh, the visible story of the individual who loses his job and it's very heartbreaking but it's a lot more difficult to take a step back and see the overall net growth of economic prosperity overall and as those new jobs continue to get created. The uh, thrust uh, of this particular study was that uh, immigration is positively correlated with economic freedom. Mm -hmm. In other words, uh, the, uh, the, the shibboleth uh, uh, oft-told story of immigration uh, opponents is that people who come from a regulated economy or from a uh, anarchic economy or whatever are going to bring their cultural values with them, which may or may not be uh, in, in, uh, may or may or may not be in conflict with the idea, uh, with the ethos of free trade. But that's also uh, disproven, and I think for the reason that you said, which is that when you have various cultures coming together and, in a sense, f needing to do business with each other. Uh, for, for economic survival and for cooperation and for the benefit of the community as a whole. They do. People get, people get along, mm -hmm. given the choice to get along, for the most part. I know you're going to have some outliers that don't want to get along, but for the most part, people get along. But the biggest issue when it comes to immigration, the biggest uh, uh, unsolvable mystery, at least for me, is this. When somebody moves from North Dakota to Texas, or vice versa, depending on where the oil is being drilled, we don't worry about it a whole heck of a lot. We just say, well, you're smart you. You went to where the jobs are. Mm -hmm. If somebody moves from uh, Ethiopia to Texas to get a job, somehow or another, that's different. And it's not. It's, the only thing different is that it's a different set of politicians drawing lines on the map uh, that uh, are totally artificial, totally, uh, you know, uh, the whim of whoever, whatever politician happens to be in power over that particular piece of territory. There's no reason at all why somebody, why somebody born in Tijuana should have different rights than somebody born 10 minutes away in San Diego. That's true. It's absolutely just heartbreaking to see a finite, arbitrary line decide someone's economic opportunity for decades to come. And the biggest issue when it comes to unemployment, which is the whole Trump thing about, uh, uh, about immigrants, they're going to come and take our jobs. Well, it's not. they're not. The biggest reason for unemployment is robotization or automation or the, you know, the coming of the robots. And even that is not really an issue because all that does is it does two things. It creates more goods and human demand is infinite. Everybody wants more stuff more services. There's no mm, limit. Not Luddites. We'll talk no about that later. No limit though. to how much people want. Mm. So the demand is unlimited. It always has been, always will be. And there's a, a big demand for leisure as well. That's why when you mentioned the Luddites, when the Luddites were working in their, at their spinning wheels or whatever for from sunrise to sunset 12, 14 hours a day, and the looms came in, and create, destroy jobs. Well, you know, that, not really, because now, instead of working from sunrise to sunset, we're working 35 hours a week, which is uh, slightly less. So, Well, leisure, you're working way less than that. <laughs> and, uh, and enjoying it uh, a lot. The leisure time is, is an economic benefit, and the more machines, the more immigrants, the more inputs that you have to create things, the more leisure time is available for those uh, who want it. And Richard, this is also a case of, of um, concentrated costs and disparate benefits. Uh, as uh, we have more immigration or more automation, we also see the price of consumer goods go down and everything becomes more affordable that is subject to this process for consumers. But those costs are, are excuse me, those gains are very dispersed and harder to see for an individual versus there is a very, uh, visible uh, amount of cost when an individual loses his job. So if you see an industry go through automation or robotization, you see that job loss very tangibly, but all of the benefits that we gain are a lot harder to see, but we are saving money from them over time. And that's particularly confused when you've got a central bank whose uh, policy is 2% inflation. It, it, it disguises uh, price uh, decreases. Uh, so it's, not, it's, very, it's very difficult to see price decreases for the most part. In some places, there's, there's price decreases even with uh, inflationary monetary policy, like in computers and uh, information tech. But in other areas, there's I want not. The there's computers and information tech where share one thing in, in, in common, the least regulated industry in existence right now. Right now, and that's a good thing. Yes. 
Minerva Dairy versus Brand Cell, is that right? Uh, Wisconsin uh, uh, saying that if you don't make butter in Wisconsin, that ain't real butter, is that the deal? So this is a fascinating case, Richard. So we have 50 states with no laws regarding ungraded butter until uh, one unlucky uh, store owner discovers that uh, Wisconsin, there is a law that prohibits ungraded butter. Now, Wisconsin is the only state out of 50, out of 50 states to require grated butter. It had this law in the books for 50 years, kind of lay dormant, no one took notice until one store owner realized that everyone else around him was selling carry cold butter, but he wasn't able to because the law said that was prohibited. So he brought this law to attention and then it started being enforced, which led to Minerva Dairy being unable to sell their butter in Wisconsin. So there's no safety issue here because the butter can be sold in any other state and the USDA is just fine with that. So there's no safety issue for uh, the actual ungraded butter. It's just an old law that's uh, been left as a remnant in Wisconsin that's now being enforced and it's hurting uh, small farmers and hurting their jobs from Minerva Dairy, who used to be able to be in business with them, but now that they can't sell their butter in Wisconsin, that creates an, a larger effect that economically hurts what them. What do you mean by grated butter? Is it it's just uh, making sure that the butter meets certain higher standards? Taste standards. So I tried to read about what exactly um, a grated butter is, and you know, it sounds a lot like wine tasting. <laughs> Uh, it's a, it's what, a subjective grade. What are the grade. flavors in this? What is the coloring? What is the texture? Did you want to chip and jump? I, it's, <laughs> it's a subjective uh, test. It is not graded on butter fat content. It's not graded. I don't think it's graded on color. It's a taste test. That's right. Right? So they hire professional butter tasters, my dream job. <laughs> um, and uh, apparently they grade butter based upon their subjective palate. And uh, again, it was a, a uh, like many laws, it, it lay there languishing until somebody needed it to, until, to, until restrain, needed job, to, so. to restrain a little trade and they, they dusted it off. And aren't, aren't these, uh, are they Amish? I mean, this is like some of the cleanest, best butter you can get that's not yeah. graded. That's well, right. Okay, yeah. okay. So, so, yeah. so we've established the grading is a misnomer. It's not really a grade, it's just a, somebody's arbitrary, uh, totally uh, subjective taste test. Yes. I mean, that's great too, isn't it? <laughs> and so the Pacific Legal Foundation is bringing a challenge to this based on the Dormant Commerce Clause. And what the, is the Dormant Commerce Clause? Glad well. you asked. <laughs> <laughs> I knew you were going to say it. I'm so glad you asked, Richard. Let me tell you what that means. Yeah. Uh, so the challenge under the Dormant Commerce Clause is that a state's uh, laws is harming out-of-state uh, producers from selling in favor of in-state producers. And this affects uh, the Commerce Clause, or in this case, the Dormant Commerce Clause. So it's an it's interstate, interstate Commerce Clause uh, argument that you know, Wisconsin is interfering in interstate commerce by having this the standard is that is that the idea? Essentially, so they're disrupting trade because it favors in-state producers compared right. to out-of-state producers who want to be selling in Wisconsin. Okay, now, um, okay, so that's the lawsuit. That's right. Has is Wisconsin actually defending this nonsense law, uh, law or are they, uh, or are they saying uh, let's settle? Uh, we have yet to find out. No, so okay. uh, not, not that right now we are seeking a preliminary injunction. So we'll see how the court responds to that. And, and the, the state is, as well. That's right. So this is uh, in state court in Wisconsin or federal court? Uh, state court of Wisconsin and St. Croix County is where the action is St. Croix. Many evil things go on in St. Croix. Is that so? Mer. <laughs> oh, wow. What a coincidence. Or not. Dun, Mer dun, County. Dun, dun. <laughs> so. Okay, let's talk about, we, we we're talking about <laughs> butter, one of my favorite uh, Substances. Another uh, substance which uh, uh, I like is is calories, but uh, I like to actually count calories. I actually do that, and I when I go to a, a restaurant, for instance, and I see the uh, calorie count uh, posted on on a menu item, I, I kind of like that. But the law, according to the, the FDA, is actually mandating that people put calories on their on their food items. Is that correct, and is that legal? 
That's right, Richard. So what's happening is that a part of Obamacare, or the ACA, included a requirement from the FDA to have restaurants and grocery stores which sell ready-to-eat items to post calorie content on all of their foods. Now, this law has been, or excuse me, this regulation has been uh, pending for quite some time now. It's supposed to take effect on May 5th, but at the 11th hour, the FDA gave uh, grocery stores and restaurants another year to fully comply with this. However, New York City has actually taken um, initiative in being frustrated with that uh, delay and implemented their own similar uh, parallel law requiring restaurants to post calories that will start taking an effect in August. They'll start rolling out fines for that. So there is a legal challenge to this in that when you tell a restaurant that they have to post calories on their menu board, it's actually a form of compelled speech. Now, Richard, we know that the First Amendment protects the right to free speech, but the right not to speak or silence is, this, is the opposite side of the same coin, and that's also protected by the First Amendment. So here, it may be unconstitutional for the FDA to compel speech from restaurants to post that calorie count. But in addition to that, um, if I may add, when that became, uh, when that law was first discussed, uh, that was seven years ago. And since then, nutritional science has also evolved a lot. So not only is it unconstitutional, but it may also be potentially misleading. So when you go to a restaurant and you see something labeled with their calories, uh, there's actually a lot more information that you might not be seeing. For example, if you take a look at a sugary cereal and some orange juice and see that it's worth 400 calories, you can also uh, compare that to some scrambled eggs with cheese and a uh, whole wheat toast, a cup of coffee, and that's also the same 400 calories. But those two items are going to affect your body very differently. And so nutritional science has been <coughs> evolving significantly. And I think in addition to uh, academic studies, there's also been a more popular push to, uh, look at the wide, to look at the more robust nutritional value of food. OK, let me ask just one follow-up question. If you're successful on this case, will it be possible to go after the ingredient lists that are also mandated on all uh, uh, prepared foods? I don't know about those details, but I can tell you that the calorie counting under this law may be unconstitutional under the First Amendment. And in addition to that, uh, we've also seen academic studies that show even when you post calorie counts, not everyone may have the same decision making as you, Richard, when you decide what meal to, to select based on the calories, and that the American Journal um, of Physical Health, or sorry, are we working <laughs> uh, no, yeah, uh, that's the show. We'll wrap her up. And thank you very much, John. Thank you very much, uh, Casey, for being part of the Libertarian Counterpoint. And we are at uh, Channel 17 Sacramento, www.accesssacramento.org, and on YouTube and cable channels all over the world. Thank you very much. And we'll see you again next year.